Good evening and welcome to The Candidates, a presidential town hall series brought to you by Daria Media and the Niger Television Authority with the support of the MacArthur Foundation. These town halls represent an opportunity for you to get to know the candidates who want your votes so they can lead Nigeria for the next four years. We are live on the network service of the Niger Television Authority on Television Continental, TVC, and on Wazobia Television, Oak TV, and Impact Africa Television. You can also hear this program on all Radio Nigeria stations across the country. And we're streaming live online at dtv.media and nta.ng live. Today, we are in conversation with the presidential and vice presidential candidates of the People's Democratic Party, the PDP, Nigeria's former vice president, Al Haji Atiku Abubakar, and the former governor of Anambra State, Mr. Peter Obi. Al Haji Atiku Abubakar has been a constant name in Nigeria's political arena since he joined politics after resigning from the Nigerian customs in 1989. He immediately joined the late Musa Eradua's political group, the People's Front of Nigeria, PFN, and quickly rose to prominence. The transition to democratic rule resulted in the emergence of former President Olusegun Obasanjo as the presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party. He picked al Haji Atiku Abubakar as his VP, although he had already contested and won the governorship election in Adamawa State. He was the vice president of Nigeria from 1999 to 2007, and although he has had a rather fractured relationship with his former boss, the two buried their differences following his emergence as the presidential candidate of the PDP. His running mate is Mr. Peter Obi, who was a businessman and banker before his foray into politics in 2003 when he contested for the governorship position in Anambra State. After the election, the incumbent Chris Ngige was declared the winner, but Mr. Obi contested the result of the election, and in 2006, the Court of Appeal ruled that he was the actual winner of the election, and he was sworn in as governor. However, less than a year after he became governor, he was impeached by the PDP-dominated House of Assembly, and his deputy was made governor. Again, Mr. Obi challenged his impeachment in court and he was reinstated in 2007. Despite the fact that a fresh election had been held in the state in April of that year, which was won by another candidate, Mr. Obi went on again to contest that fact that he had not spent his constitutionally allowed four years in office. The court ruled in his favor and he was allowed to continue until 2010. In 2010, he contested again and won his second term in office. His tenure as governor came to an end in March 2014. Welcome, sirs, to the candidates. Now, with us tonight are also members of the diplomatic corps, civil society, political parties, and of course, citizens who have questions for our candidates. I too will have a few, but as important are also the questions that are coming from those of you watching us at home. So if you want to participate, here is how to do it. Send your questions on any of the following social media handles. On Twitter, at the Daria Media, or at NTA News Now. On Facebook, at the Daria Media. On Instagram, at Daria Media NG. Throughout the program, these handles will scroll across your screen. Don't forget to use the hashtag NG the candidates. Otherwise, your questions may get lost. Again, remember to tell your friends and family in the diaspora that they can watch this program online. We are streaming live on dtv.media and nta.ng live. Now, welcome to the candidates, sirs. Thank you. 
I'd like to start by asking you why you believe Nigerians should elect you as president and vice president in a few weeks when they go to the polls. Thank you, <coughs> Kaneria. Um, in the last almost uh, four years now, we have witnessed the performance of the current administration. And I believe Nigerians should be able to compare the records of achievements of the previous PDP administration and the current APC administration. In, in, in summary, the APC administration came into office with a promise to address three serious issues. One of which is to improve the economy, to fight corruption, and also to contain the Boko Haram insurgency in the Northeast. At the time they came in, Nigeria's economic performance was fairly good. Our GDP growth was about 6%. Immediately they came in, they took us into recession. And we are still getting out into recession. Our GDP growth now is about 2%. I don't think that's a good performance. So Secondly, when you go to the fight against corruption. Either today or yesterday, we had the latest Transparency International report. We have not fared better than when the APC administration came into well, office. Well, we've gone up four places. Yeah. So, I mean, not, you know, they would argue yeah, actually yeah, there's yeah, been improvement. Yeah, yes. Okay. But let I me mean, When we let come me, to the issue of security, let me learn, Kandaria. When we come to the issue of security, at the time they came in, the security challenge was restricted to the Northeast. Today it has spread to two other northern zones, Northwest and North Central. I don't think that's a good performance. So on the basis of that, I think Nigerians need to know that the current APC administration has really not performed to their expectations. Okay, so your, your, your estimation is that they're not doing well. But that's, that can be your qualification for becoming president because alongside you, there are because, two, three other people yes. who think that they should be president. Yeah, and so my course. question is quite specific. Why you? Why me? Because I'm bringing quite a lot of on the table. I would like to claim that amongst us, as far as experience is concerned, I'm the most experienced. Secondly, I'm also bringing my business experience, which I acquired over a long period, almost two decades after leaving public service. And of course, thirdly, I believe that I am a candidate for the future because I try to bridge the current generation with the future generation. So. Now, he, he, let me bring in Mr. Obedia. Um, Elijah Atiku has talked about the fact that he's a bridge between the future and the, the, and the present. And yet he is, I believe, in his 70s. There was a time when you were very critical of candidates in their 70s. In fact, in a conversation I had with you, in an interview I did with you, you bemoaned the fact that um, Nigeria was having older candidates. And yet here you are contesting for office with a man of a certain age. Why is that? Well, Claire, let me go back and a bit and support the position of the candidate. Why him and why I should be there to support him? Today we have record insecurity that this country has not witnessed. 
We have record unemployment. We have 21 Nigerian youths unemployed in their productive age. Today we have a record out of school children, 13.5 million. We have, if you look at all indices of development, it's gotten worse. Our HDI now is 157, which is the, one of the lowest. And inequality, we are 157 over 157. Stress, we are 148 out of 150. In fact, you can go on and on. In security, we are now number three after Afghanistan and Iraq. And it's predicted that we will be worse than them. So when you look at all this record, you need somebody with experience. Somebody that can, one, we're so divided today, that can unify and, the and country. We, and we will and for me, you're talking about issue of age. So I'm looking at the experience. If you look at the cumulative experience of a large article, you know why at this time we need somebody who has this experience and a unifier that can bring the country together. And I will be there to support him considering the age difference. When we talk about suitability of office, the biggest issue that comes up again and again when people talk about your candidacy is that of corruption. People allege that you have question marks around your integrity. So let me start by addressing that issue before we go into the question of your manifesto and the things that you want to do. Do you believe Nigeria has a corruption problem? Certainly, Nigeria has a corruption problem. There is no doubt about that. What, I, what, what in your view is corruption? Well. In my view in corruption, corruption is the use of your privileged position to either enrich yourself or enrich your relatives or even your friends. Okay. And so would it be in fair other words, for In us other words, to, abuse of office. So would it be fair, therefore, using that definition to examine your record in office vis-a-vis -vis this definition, starting with... Um, your time as a custom officer at the Apapa ports and the setting up of a logistics company that did clearing and forwarding while you were in a custom officer. Would you consider that an abuse of office? Certainly not, because it was an issue of share purchase. And at that point, it was very, very lawful for any public officer to purchase shares. Okay. And this is exactly... Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, you, you must remember, I don't know how old you were, but you must, <laughs> you must remember um, there I was, am not as young as there, I was <laughs> there was the indigenization decree which was passed by the then military government, which allowed public officers to legitimately acquire shares in their attempt to indigenize most you know, of the companies that were operating at that time that were owned by experts. Okay, let, let, me, let, me tr let me try and see if I can get this right because the information in the public domain is not that this was an existing company in which you acquired shares. This is a company that you actually set up with an Italian shareholder, a Mr. Volpi, and which you registered. And the primary job of that business was clearing and logistics. I'm sorry. At a time, I'm let me sorry. ask, I'm let me sorry. ask, and then you can go clarify. Ahead, go ahead, because at, at a time when you were a customs officer who was responsible, actually, for making sure that the business of clearing and forwarding was done lawfully and that Nigeria was paid duty according to all the rules that were laid down. Now, is that information that's in the public domain accurate or not? It's not correct. Okay. Let me tell you. Nicotes at that time was not registered as a clearing and forwarding agency. It was a registered company to undertake logistics in oil and gas. And that is what it still does. No more, no less. This is the same company that transformed and metamorphosized into Intel's. That's right. And which 
in 2016, oh, sorry, 2006, was given um, an extended 25-year uh, concession in some key ports in this country. But more than that, it was given monopoly for the oil and gas sector at a time when you were the vice president of Nigeria. Again, Do you see that this could be a moral problem or not? Again, you are very, very incorrect. Okay, please correct me. Because <clears throat> the issue of monopoly was not there. There were still companies that we met in the ports that were doing exactly what Intel was doing. So there, was, there is no question of monopoly. It's a mis complete misrepresentation of the facts. There was no, no monopoly at all. Calabar, worry, on a go, all concessioned to you and nobody else. Go, go, no. It's not all of on it. It's not all of worry. It's not all the of The oil Calabar. and gas business, the logistics oil and gas business the, was there, you. There was competition, and there is still competition. No, now there is. No, there was. There was still competition. Okay, so, you so know, what you should have done was to make or conduct a research. I did. I did. There were. I did. What was Browell doing? This is, this is, no, I was asked, I'm what this is on your company website, by the way. Wait, this is not information from an outsider. No, I'm but, taking this from your company website. But, but, but you should have also cross-checked to see whether what the company was saying is correct or not? Your company made a mistake about the fact that it's, they have it's, a monopoly. It's, 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 it's quite possible. Okay. Let me turn to Mr. Obi, because you have similar allegations against you of a conflict of interest. When you were governor of Anambra State, your, your, you invested in a brewery. You put money worth about two billion naira of the state money in a brewery, Interfact, I think, beverages. Your company next, according to the um, Corporate Affairs Commission, is a major shareholder in this, in this particular brewery. How can you justify that? That you took money belonging to Anambra State and the people of Anambra State and invested it in a business in which you are a major shareholder? Thank you very much. Canada. I brought international brewers into Nigeria. SBM Miller. I brought them into Nigeria. And as a governor of a state, they built a greenfield facility in the state. And they came to me and said, as our partner, we want you to own 15% of this company. And I said to them, no. Right now, I'm a governor of a state. I know the future of this brewery. I want this state to own 10%. And since I'm no longer involved in this company, they can own 5%. Because they are putting $30 million of state money there. It's now worth $100 million. And it's still there. And it's still there. No other state in this country has such investment. How much have you personally made I've not, from that brewery? I have no investment there, not one naira. No, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. Next I, is a business that is associated with you. I, go and to according the, to the Corporate Affairs Commission, go, next go to, is a shareholder Go in to this Corporate brewery. Affairs today. If you see Peter be as owner of one share, one, I didn't say one, one share. It doesn't exist. No, next. I, Are next, you disassociating you. yourself from Thank you next? very much. Next is a family company started by my own parents. As a, as a son, as their own child, I ran it at a time when I became governor. I had nothing to do with next. Okay, so how much today. has your family made? from the investment. Thank you very much. How much has your, no, see, this is a serious question. I'm sorry. I am sorry. Very, I am sorry. Please, very good, very good please. question. Nigerians are watching this, okay? Very good question. Okay, no, no, no. Let, let, let's ask this question. You took money belonging to Anambra State Government and put it in a company in which your family has interest. That's what you're telling me. No, look, let me tell you. Look at what you're saying. I bought shares in banks. Let me tell you what I did. It wasn't only in that that I invested. 
I invested $50 million of Anambra state money in power sector. I invested another 10, over several billions in banks, including banks where I have share. I was investing for the future of the state. It doesn't matter whether I have shares there or not. But so, if the shares are making profit, so if I have an opportunity of building a future for the state, shouldn't I have done that? Okay, so can we agree that, in your view, as long as you are making money for the state, if some of that money finds its way into your pocket, it's not a problem? Never. No, no. Is that Canada. what you're saying? No, I'm trying to get clarity. No, no, let me, let me tell you. Yeah, no, 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 let me, let me, let me, let me clarify it. Okay. I left office. I left office in this country. I left office in this country, living in Anambra State, with an investment and cash of 75 billion naira. It's never happened in this country. The day I left office, the day I left office, I had Infidelity Bank, $56 million, $12 billion naira for Anambra State. I had in Diamond Bank, $50 million, $12 billion naira for Anambra State. I had in Access Bank, $50 million, $12 billion naira for Anambra State. Show me in the history of this country where anybody has left 10% of that. Thank you. And we're going to come back and talk about, you know, your, your track record as governor. But let me come back to um, Alhaji Atiku Abubakar. In your manifesto, you have a plan for tackling corruption, which you've agreed is a problem in this country. What is it? I'd like to hear what you plan to do. I have said that there is need for us to go by the adage of the English saying, which says, Prevention is better than cure. We can have both going side by side. Punitive measures, preventive measures. And my point is that we should be able to introduce technology in our public service. We should be able to introduce technology even in the private sector. So that relationship between members of the public and the uh, members of the public and government is not personal. I give an example of the United Arab Emirates, whose citizens are not as educated as Nigeria. And yet, by introducing technology in their public service, they have virtually eliminated corruption in, in the sense that there is no personal contact between. You can stay in your room on your computer, apply for whatever license you want to apply, and you get approval. Okay, so, so basically so, you, you want to... So I, I really want... Automate everything. Yes, right. to automate, you know, the public service and make sure that contact to contact, which brings about the tendency, you know, for corruption, that one is eliminated. If you eliminate that, then you would have succeeded in reducing the incidence of corruption to the barest minimum. Okay, so I'm going to start taking questions because, you know, it's not just me talking... And some of them we collected from people online. I will take some from people at home. But let me start with uh, Mr. Ayo Ali. And he basically said, um, will you make EFCC fully independent and mandate them to go after everyone, even your friends? How would you reform the criminal justice system and judiciary, given the lack of confidence Nigerians have in it to deliver justice against public officials and politicians? who are corrupt. This is from Mr. Ayo Ali. My quarrel with our judicial system is that there is too much delay. If we can shorten the delay so that justice is seen to be meted out immediately, the better for us. What in your view is responsible for that delay? And how will you tackle it? He's looking at the legislature and also the procedures being adopted by, by, by the judiciary. We have to look at it. We have to sit down you know, with the National Assembly and with the judiciary itself and say, look, I mean, you know that the cases 
we initiated in our administration are still in court. Do you know that? Yeah. Now, where is the justice there? And we set up the EFCC. I, in particular, brought the piece of draft legislation from Brazil. And it was based on that draft that <laughs> EFCC legislation was crafted. When it was eventually passed by the National Assembly, EFCC did not even have the money in the budget to start operation. I borrowed them 300 million naira from the privatization process and said, you better get to work. The following year when there was budgetary allocations, they repaid the money. So I believe the period that it takes, most of the convictions we are hearing today were cases that we started in our administration. We are going to have to take a quick break. Please don't go away. Welcome back. You are watching The Candidates, a presidential town hall series brought to you by Daria Media and the Nigeria Television Authority with the support of the MacArthur Foundation. 
we are in conversation with the presidential and vice presidential candidates of the PDP. A quick reminder to those of you watching at home, you can still take part by sending your questions using the social media handles scrolling across the screen. We will do our best to ask the candidates as many questions as possible. Um, so before the break, you'd started talking to us about um, what you intend to do around the judiciary and um, agencies that are mandated to fight corruption on the basis of a question asked by somebody. Um, I'd like you to go into a little bit more detail regarding that particular plan that you have. And this is um, particularly important in light of the recent issues around the judiciary that are going on in this country. And of course, the fact that for many years now, there have been allegations that the people who are supposed to administer justice um, are, are corrupt and selling justice to the highest bidder. So what sort of reform are we looking at if you become president of the judiciary, but also of the agencies charged with investigating um, corrupt crimes? Well, I thank you very much again. I have already <coughs> indicated to you the kind of reform I want to you know, undertake. That reform has to, number one, shorten the period of investigation by investigative agencies. But, but how will you do this? Well, it's, you, it's the you, how that I'm after. You, you have to legislate. This is a country that is governed by rule of law. So you can only rule of law, you know, to approach issues. And therefore, you have to legislate. I'm In other words, investigation agencies must have a time limit. Okay. Within which, within which to investigate, there must be a time limit within which to prosecute, and there must be a time limit by the judiciary to dispense justice. Now, generally, financial crimes tend to be complex and complicated. How practical is it for you to say to a man who is investigating someone who's maybe? Uh, taking money out of state coffers, or who's been, you know, uh, beneficiary of proceeds of crime, where maybe the chain is abroad in different countries that they must do their work within a, a short period of time. Won't you be denying justice? By no, 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 no. Why is it that other countries are doing it within a shorter period of justice? Are they denying justice to their citizens? <laughs> but there are it, no. What I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that. So, so in other countries, it could take this much or it could take this much. We've seen them investigate crimes that have taken many, many years yes. and eventually bring people to book. In other words, there are no statute of limitations for certain types of crimes. What you seem to be suggesting is that you want to put some sort of statute of limitation. Not necessarily, because I don't like even statute of limitations, because sometimes you let criminals go. Why? Why in this era of technology, what financial investigations will not be able to do within a specified reasonable period of time? I believe it is doable. Honestly. If you become president today, what about existing cases? What are you going to do about them? I believe there will be need for dialogue between the various branches of government. Look, we are at a very, very crisis point in this country on the issue of fight against corruption. We can't afford delays. Before we review our procedures and our laws, I think there is need we do something immediately. And I believe everybody will understand if you really intend to fight uh, corruption. Would you consider an amnesty where you say to people who've been involved in corrupt practices that bring back money and we draw a line and then going forward, we begin to implement ABC. Why not? i give you an example of Turkey. Turkey gave an amnesty. And all the money abroad came back to Turkey. And the government said, when you bring the money, there is even no taxation. We want you to invest in manufacturing. We want you to invest in technology. We want you to invest in, we want you to invest in real estate. And look at Turkey today. It's like 
any other European country in terms of its development. And then they drew a line. Why not? We could consider it. No, but have you considered it? Um, is that personally, what I'm personally, yes. Personally, I have considered it. Okay. Why not? You will realize that for a few Nigerians, this will be problematic. Yes, it will because be. Because it, it, it sounds like it will be, but an, a way of have, trying to allow they, those who've stolen money they, to get have, away with what it. What have they been able to achieve? Let me tell you what we achieved when we, we came into the office to fight corruption. There was a recovery panel set up by President Obasanjo under my chairmanship. Myself, the Attorney General and the National Security Advisor. And by calling various people who have been alleged to have stolen money, we recovered over four billion US dollars which we paid back into the treasury. <laughs> if you were to go and prosecute these people up till now, you will still be prosecuting them and that money would have been denied you. So, I mean, there are a number of the, 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 the moral issue with that though is that in many ways people say there are two problems. First is that corruption then looks as if it pays. And so therefore, people are not, there's no deterrent for people because they feel that if they steal, there's always going to be an opportunity for them to be able to make a deal and come back because they're bringing money back. And then you're sort of sending the wrong signals as well to people who are coming up because this is, we, are, we now have a culture it, and people are trying to change that it, culture. It all depends on what you want to achieve. Whether it is moral rectitude you want to achieve or you want to see a fast development of your country from proceeds of corruption and so on and so forth. It all depends on what you want to achieve. I'm going to take a few questions from the audience. Um, the lady in pink, the gentleman over here with the glasses, um, right at the back, the lady in the black scarf, and then the, the gentleman yeah, in the glasses as well. Four of you, then we'll come back to the candidates. Um, please keep it short, because there are a lot of people that want to talk. <laughs> Can you move a bit closer to the mic? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to suspend the audience questions because that mic has a problem. And so I'm going to just keep talking to the candidates until that mic is sorted. My apologies that we're having a technical problem. Um, let's, before, because I mean, we we're going to talk about your economic plan and all of that, but um, on the issue of um, um, corruption again, um, just one last conversation and then we move to the economy. The United States Senate Committee mentioned your wife by name in a case involving a German company, Siemens, which actually um, was fined and faced charges of corruption. What are your views regarding that specific case in which your wife was fingered? My, my view about it is that my wife has not been indicted, my wife has not been charged. So because she has not been indicted, she has not been charged, I don't accept that view. Do you feel the need to clear this, that there's like a moral uh, burden on you to actually clear her name? Because the, the, what, the, the report was quite specific. I'm sure you know the report. Yeah, I know. I am aware of the report. Yes. I'm aware it was quite of the specific report. about what it is claimed she did. And there was no doubt that the, the huge sums of money were found in her account. And a company was fined for paying her at least $2 million. The, the company was fined for a number of offenses it committed. Not necessarily on the issue of my wife's account. What I can tell you is that my wife has never been indicted, 
and she has never been charged. So there is no way you can hold my wife accountable. Okay. If my wife is an American, mark you, she is an American, there is no way they will not have charged her to court or indicted her. Has she been to America since that report? She has came been traveling to America. Okay. She's been traveling to America. <laughs> she goes and comes very, very regularly. Okay. So you wanted to say something. So you yeah, just to add on this issue of corruption, because you've been going on, on in it, which is critical. But the question to ask, is it better to have an amnesty where somebody will say, we're not going to look at yesterday, bring back the money and invest it, and help to rejuvenate the economy and create jobs, or that you join another party and it becomes a safe haven and you can keep it? <laughs> A follow-up. Okay. This is just, not just a follow-up. Mm -hmm. Not just a follow-up. We have had issue of issue of fighting corruption and the noise associated with it. Where you took over an economy that was five hundred and twenty billion dollars with a per capita for every Nigerian of two hundred. 2,500, and you abandoned about growing the economy and was busy chasing what seemingly does not exist in your own. And then you ended up not recovering even $5 billion, okay, so, and the economy have lost okay, so there, 120 there are, something billion. There are two issues. We are now, where every Nigerian per capita is, is, is below 2,000. Okay, so, so, let's, let's deal so with we that. have all lost $500 so let's deal while you are busy, not adding anything. Okay, so let, let's deal with the two issues. Um, the issue of the economy, which um, other critics will argue is actually a direct result of 16 years of a PDP government, and we'll come back to that. But starting with the, the issue that you made about, when, when you said that, is it better to um, do an amnesty? or Part of the problem that many Nigerians have is that actually they don't see any daylight between the PDP and the APC. No, as, far, no, as far as they are concerned, you are the same. Let me because tell you, you there is. Moving. No, let me finish. The, the, Nigerian, the Nigerian politician seems to have no issues moving from one party to the other, depending on which party is going to allow him to contest. And the two of you sitting here are no exception. The answer is... Who is an exception, if I may ask no. you? Is it President Buhari who had four parties? <laughs> who is an exception? It is exactly yes, the point I I'm like, making. Uh, yes, I, it's exactly, yes, I, it's exactly, I, because sometimes, sometimes, I, let, me, let me finish, let me finish. On this program alone, we've had two it, other parties let, that offer alternatives to both the AP, APC and to the PDP. And the people who are followers of this party point to this particular issue as one of the reasons why people should vote neither for the PDP nor for the APC. They yeah, see you me, as the same. Let me tell you the difference. The difference is that those who have caught, who are in PDP today are actually cleaner because that those who are not running away from persecution. The people remaining. <laughs> those, who have, those who have bad records have moved on to APC because they can't stand what is happening. So they've actually moved. And to further let's tell have, you... Let's, let's pause for a moment. Let's no, 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 let me tell you for you. Let's pause for a moment. Let's, let's, let's talk, let's have a serious, let's have a serious, this is a serious platform. Let's That's have a serious saying. conversation. Yeah, I want us to be serious yes, about let, it. Let's have a serious conversation. Excuse me. Please have respect for Nigerians who are watching this. Thank you. 
Let me be let's, serious about it. Okay, let's be serious about this conversation that we're having. You, apart from PDP, you were a member of another party, ABGA. And in fact, part of the, the, the criticism against you from a few people um, that I spoke to in Anambra, including newspaper articles that I researched, is that you had an opportunity to build ABGA, to be a third national party, and you abandoned it. And the reason you abandoned it, presumably, or I was told, is because you felt it did not allow you to have, to play politics at the center. So I, I'm trying to, 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 to understand this issue of what Nigerian is politicians who- No, what is wrong in that? You. If I have to go to London, Canary, and I have a vehicle, and I can drive my car from Lagos, from Monica to Lagos, and I found that I can't drive the same car to London, I join a plane, what is wrong in it? So, so, because, so, no, 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 so we, we no, can no, agree, we, we can agree it is about what works for Mr. Peter. No, 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 it's not what works for Peter. No, it is for it what is, works it for is Mr. What, it is Mr. Obi having an opportunity to help in building a better society. Right. If I'm going to do it better here, I'll turn here. Like I said today, PDP, actually, if you check all you've said about Elijah Tikubaka is alleged, alleged, alleged. Even when he went to America, they shouted that before he comes back, you first question. He has since come back, no question. <laughs> but I can tell you, I can tell you, if you go on the other side, and you can see it everywhere. So issue of fighting corruption have actually hurt us more. The record has gone from 136 to 148. You said it's been proved. They've come down to 144. But we're still worse than we are today. Let's talk about corruption, even what is happening today, where we don't even have a rate of exchange in this country. Okay. And you're Which talking about corruption. Me, yeah, so let's so start talking about actually the economy. Today. Let me bring in Alaji Ajibu Abaka, because you've been big on, you've been big on um, your manifesto uh, has been <coughs> largely before, driven be, before, by... Yeah, before I go to the economy, let okay. me maybe put uh, a, a closing uh, idea to this uh, corruption mm -hmm. issue. You know, one other serious corruption that is facing us is elections rigging. It's also a form of corruption. You know the idea I have? Why can't we not have an election fraud commission? So that we bring to book any individual, whether he's a member of any political party, or a member of uh, INEC, or even a member of the security services, who infringes any electoral but, but, but I think the courts are already, we've just had um, INEC uh, workers um, that uh, took bribe during the this last is, this election is like, process. This is like, like approaching the corruption issue because it is becoming a very serious issue. So if it requires us having a special investigation bureau, election fraud commission, why not? Okay, so part of the difficulty um, that faces Nigerians when they hear ideas like this about setting up this and setting up that is that it's not that these ideas are necessarily new. It's that we never seem to have the political will to actually see these things through. So people come You know where the political will ideas. is? You yes. know where the political is? Here. Yeah. Why? 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 Because we have been successful both in government, in public, and in private. This country, let me tell you, Kadri, let me tell you, Kadri, this country requires a leadership that is pro-business, pro-private sector, so that we can get out of this mess we have found ourselves. 21 million young men and women unemployed who have never had it this bad in this country. Okay, so let's talk this, about this, that. This, this, this. Let, let's, let's talk about that. Let's be quite specific about that. What are you going to do about that? You keep talking about making Nigeria better in specific terms because talking about the economy in terms of private sector led seems as if you're trying to build a government for the rich by the rich. 
Where are the plans for the poorest of the poor? I want to hear those plans. Now, you see, we had more people in the middle class bracket during the PDP administration than we have in the APC administration of today. The middle class is completely eliminated. I'm not necessarily... And you have to, and you, you, and you, and you have, to have a middle class before you can uplift the ones in the bottom. Because it doesn't just happen like that. So essentially, if you become president, uh, come uh, May, if you're sworn in and you win elections in February, Nigeria's poor people have to wait a little while Not for you to build a, So I'm trying to understand. No, 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 no. So, so please. Are you a socialist? No, I'm not. But <laughs> our, our, people, our people, everybody agrees that the situation of our people is very dire. Very dire. Right? And that um, the gap between the rich and the poor and inequality is growing. And I'm trying to understand what you, as a president, will do for the poorest of the poor. I'm kind of clear that your government and your plan, you have a place for businessmen. You, you have, have a place for international investors. You have a place for anybody with a bit of money that wants to do some work. Did you read? Do you what, have a place you, for the do, poor of Nigeria? Yes, do you read our policy on agriculture? I'm trying to look at it now, but it's uh, short on the how. Yeah, yeah. No, it's short, so, on, the, it's see, short on the how. Let, let me tell you. It's short it, on the how. Yes. Now, and it's not that different from of, what has been done before. One of our major plans is to create jobs. And the greatest job creation sector in this country is the agri sector. And our agri policy seeks to really empower the farmers to be more commercially oriented where they cannot, we have a system whereby they will be supported and assisted, you know, to be. I have never seen a... How is it different from the current Angkor Borowas program and Misrai, which is being run But the Angkor Borowas go to KBNC, go to KBNC, whether it's not fake, it's fake. A lot of, it, it, that's not what some people say. You go, you go to KB2, you went, see the rice farmers uh, as well. Yes, you have the rice farmers, but how many of them? Few of them like that. So you're Instead of them to expand. Okay, so it's the, the same program, but you would just do it better. In fact, the PDP was doing it better. When we introduced, when we introduced the purchase of fertilizer on your mobile phone, and we had our, our agricultural output was much higher than the present administration. Okay, let me ask about, because I'm, I'm really concerned about your manifesto as it, 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 it pertains to private sector driven economic growth. Because your policy document talks about lifting up to 50 million out of poverty by 2025. But again, I'm, I'm not sure that I am, I am understanding the how. Okay. The how is a little bit, you know, iffy. Okay, okay. Let, 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 me, let me give you just one illustration what I try to do, you know, locally. Kaduria, I set up a few years ago a microfinance bank. I brought in somebody from Bangladesh. You know, when it comes to the issue of microfinance, they are the best experts in the world. And I told him, look, I want to move families out of poverty. And I want you to dedicate 80% of your loans to women. Do you know how many families we have lifted out of poverty? 45,000. If, if in Adamawa State, in the Northeast. Okay. So if in that small area, I could lift 45,000 families out of poverty through my one single microfinance bank, which is now going to be a regional micro, because it's so successful, because the recovery rate is 98%, because these women are paying. Okay. So, the, the so yeah, the, the, it's, the, it's, it's, it's quite possible. You lift people out of poverty okay. through empowering particularly women. And yet Adamawa still remains one of the poorest yes, yes. in Nigeria. Yes, but, but and why, they've, why, had, why? They've, they've had you, a man who's been vice president, for eight years, um, someone who, 
I am going to ask the questions no matter how you shout, so you might as well just <laughs> let me talk. I am going to ask the questions. Ask. So, so, so the, the Adamawa still remains one of the poorest countries, and therefore, when, if you talk about people who want to look at antecedents, because you kept talking about your record, your record, your record. And so it's a fair question for people to ask. If your home state has not seen an appreciable change as a result of your major um, sitting in an office of that of the vice president, why should we believe you would do better for the rest of Nigeria? Again, you have got it wrong because you have tried, you didn't try to compare what was it before and now. Today, give, give us the numbers. I, I may not be able to give you the numbers, but today... So I can tell you. Oh, well, you can tell me, but then you have to convince me that you, are, you, you have the right... Uh, I, I have the numbers. Uh -huh. So Adamawa has, for the last 20 years, come in sort of 20, 26, 27, in the index of poor mm. states in Nigeria. Mm. It hasn't shifted much. Maybe one place in the last 20 years. Then it cannot be one place in the last 20 it, years. It, it must, it must be place. maybe be in the last maybe 10 years. No, I'm talking about 20 years. I looked at the numbers before coming in here. Uh, because it's one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about. But it has shifted. Seeing as it is your state. But it has shifted. A little bit. So one single individual is able to make that shift. Isn't, so imagine but if it is if it is but, but isn't that part of the problem actually that how in all your influence you've not been able to build another you in Adamawa or someone close to you do you know how long it took me that to is be, all about you do you know how long it took me to be what I am do you know from what background I came okay so I was told when I was researching this that there are two major employers in Adamawa one is the state government and the second is you. Yeah. And part of the conversation we had was how come the you know, economy of Adamawa is not big, getting bigger enough. This is a place, like you pointed out, rich in agriculture and a lot of other things. And yet people are stuck in poverty. They've had people in, at the highest possible office. And this is the conversation. And the same thing with Anambra, because you talked about leaving money in your coffers. The problem people say is, yes, you left money, but actually the kind of things that you could have done. So you built roads. You built, these are like mundane things that anybody with a bit of money could have done. And that there's nothing tangible that could transform an umbra that you did while you were in office. How will you respond to that? Let me go, let me go back to the issue where you discussed about job creation and about what you said about a larger school. You showed that clearly that in Adamawa, the two major employers is government and him. <laughs> Let me tell you what you've said. You've actually said that as an individual, he's made a success of his life. And I'm using that experience, Kaderia, if a person can manage a combo, if a person can manage a combo, he can manage an era. You've shown, his, his shown success in her own little space. And using this experience, he wants to transform it into a national issue. The people who are there today and those who are arguing don't have such experience. <laughs> so they don't have such experience. You cannot say of any other presidential candidate that after his state, his major employer. Show me one. None of them. So, you have not seen what I'm saying about his experience. It is this experience that you can, it is this experience that is going to transform. When you, should, when you mention issue of job creation, let me add to what he said about when he's going to do, create 50 million jobs. This is not rocket science. It's been done everywhere globally. Let me just give you an example. Within the last two years, India was the highest country with the highest people living with extreme poverty. In 2015, it was 176 million. 
Nigeria was then about 70. Today, Nigeria is above 90. In fact, World Bank report this year said we're going to top 100. We're getting worse. India has now moved from 176 to 76. So India, in two, call it three years, have been able to pull out 100 million people out of poverty. Whatever they, they did to achieve that, we can learn and do exactly that. What we have today in government is that you have people who are incapable of learning becoming teachers. We can learn what they're doing. Okay. You know what Nigeria went to India to do recently? Yeah. To borrow $100 million, five city. Let's stop borrowing and learn what they're doing to improve their economy. Again, in the issue of job creation, mm. the easiest way to create jobs is to empower your micro, small, and medium businesses. Okay, but, they are the greatest but employer you, but, but you everywhere are, in you, the you, world. You realize that this government actually does have programs doing that. And so, and so, and so, the question, yeah, yeah. The yeah, question, yeah, yeah. Let me tell you the question is always going to be, how is your program we are going to different move different let me tell you from what is already being done thank you very much let me tell you why the difference it took this government 3 years to even formulate a program they were in office for 3 years <laughs> atiku abubakar already have a program so it's going to move immediately to program implementation not formulation we took this for 3 years and that 3 years was wasted trying to formulate what you can see have fallen like a pack of cards. Because if it took you two years to say, I'm going to achieve 4% growth, and you're not achieving two, you may even fail based on your own, your own exam, exam you set for yourself. Your people failed when you set the exam for yourself. And that is what is catching up here. It is easy. That experience is, is hard. On a small scale, is that what is going to transform in a larger scale? And being that both of us, with this direction, we've managed resources. If you have created resources that manage one, it's easier for you to further expand that. And it's very easy. If you don't move this economy where it is private sector driven, you're wasting everybody's time. And so ideologically, deficit, ideologically, you are clear, both of you, that the programs you're going to be pursuing are going to be private sector driven. That's what is obtainable in the world today. The, it's very simple. Virtually, virtually, virtually every part of the world is in trouble today because they've realized that capitalism has left a lot of people behind. Which people are in trouble? Which, hang on, I'll tell Which you. Which of them? I'll tell, tell you. me. I'll tell you. You have problems in America because there's a percentage of Americans that lashed out because they felt left behind. So there's a general Can I, there's, a pro, there's, a, there's a problem. There's a problem. There's a, there's a problem let me finish, everywhere. Sir, okay. With all due respect, let me ask my question, okay. please. Okay. Yeah. yeah? The point I'm trying to make is that generally this rabid capitalism in pursuit of money is believed to be leaving a lot of people behind and is, leaving, is, is growing the gap between the rich and the poor. And, and I'm trying to get clarity from you whether you, you understand the issues associated with the sort of kind of uh, economy that you want to pursue, especially in a country where already there are major issues of poverty. Karen, leaving people out of poverty has been private sector driven. China has driven 439 million people out of poverty within 15 years. It can, they only achieved it because they took the private sector led. Do not use America and compare. Every society has its own little problems. You cannot use the little problem of America to compare what is happening here 
You said I should give no, you No, no, you can't. Let me, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, but if you, if you ask Nigerians today, do you want to live in America? I can tell you the present condition, 99% will, will throw in their passport today and leave Nigeria. If you ask American, Americans, do you want to come to Nigeria? Nobody will want to go because do even you, Bloomberg have said yeah, this believe, is the most stressful country to live in today. Do you believe that Nigeria's problems started in the last three years? Or do you sincerely and can look at Nigerians in the face and tell them that nothing they are experiencing today has nothing to do with things that have happened in the past 16 years? Let me tell you as a finance person, there's something we call a discounted position. What you see today, 16 years of PDP, which is far better than what we're seeing, was a discounted position. That's what they were telling us. They, 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 don't know, what mean, Please what explain mean, discounted you know, position. Now I want to say, if you come to me, if you come to me, okay, let me give you. In 2015, APC was going around and said, the country is broke. The country's economy is collapsed. There's insecurity. There's this. They promised us to make Naira one to one. Um, they, that, what, that, what, that, no, no, what, no, we, no. We have to do fact checks when we're doing one this. Minute, one minute. No, no, come on. Let come me finish. On. Let me finish. Let's be serious now. Let me we're finish. A serious conversation. Come on. Let me finish. That's what the, the promise come was. Come on now. Come on now. Okay. Let me finish. They promised that they will end Boko Haram in six months. They promised that they're going to give Nigerians power. They promised issue of fuel being 47 naira. Mm -hmm. They promised, go and check what we see today. All we're saying is, let's look at your promises and know those. They promised to create 3 it's, million jobs. It's, 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 it's and we've lost 13 million jobs. Yeah, okay, so it's, it's difficult because obviously if I, if I, I'm not an APC and, person and I can't keep trying to... I can't keep... No, I can't keep trying to... to it would be nice if we focus on what you are doing. The simple reason being, any time I push back at you, it will look as if I'm trying to speak for the APC, and I don't want to. Okay, let me right? tell you what we're so, doing. So, exactly. So let's focus on what you are doing. Let me tell and you why about. it is different from what obtains. Thank you. I have actually told you where we are today, that we have seen record poverty in Nigeria. Mm. Where we are now the poverty capital of the world. And then I believe that with the policies of PDP at Tiku's government, you continue to see annual reduction in that position. Okay. Let's um, take a few questions. The people I called earlier, they need to finish up. I hope these mics are now working. Huh? Try it and see. They should be working. Okay. Hello? Yeah, should be okay. Hello? Can you keep working? Good evening, Nigerians. Please, if you can be quiet so we can actually hear them. Please. Um, my name is Albuquerque Tsohomusa. I'm a pharmacist and a Nigerian with a passion for a better Nigeria. And I'm directing my question to Aleja Atiku Abubakar. And it's regarding employment and job creation because that's what you keep mentioning. And, um, as a successful businessman, I'll put it this way. I'm an applicant applying to work in your successful company. And after passing through some processes, your HR department, that's the human resource department, asked me to provide a referee from my previous place of work to enable me secure the job. And I have something to say. This is the response of my employer, whom I've worked with for the past eight years. And this is what he has to say. And I quote, his propensity to corruption, his tendency to disloyalty, his inability to say and stick to the truth all the time, his propensity for poor judgment, his belief and reliance on marabout, 
his lack of transparency, his trust in money to buy his way on all issues, and his readiness to sacrifice morality, integrity, propriety, truth, national interest, national interest for self and selfish interest. My question is, if, if my previous employee forward this reference to you, will you employ me? Okay, thank you. We get the question. We get the question. That, that's, that's fine. That's fine. We have the question. Please, can we have some silence? Please. 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 Good evening. Good evening. My name is Shankila. Your Excellency, you have already identified you have already identified you have already identified insecurity as a major problem in this country. Um, a number of factors usually account for this insecurity, but my major concern here is the problem of the herdsmen and farmers clashes all over Nigeria, particularly affecting the states of Benue, Baraba, Plateau, and so on and so forth. Politics is about interest, Your Excellency. Everybody will want to vote you because they know that you have uh, please your ask your question. <laughs> Look at the queue behind him. So, ask your question. Your Excellency, my question, sir, my question, sir, is that I want to know exactly your blueprint on how to deal with the problem of herdsmen and farmers clashes in Nigeria, particularly, sir, as a full man who is also in the business from your video clips was also in the business of rearing cattle. And as a thief man, the great shelter of the thief people, the Tegemolo thief, I want to know particularly, sir, how you intend in your blueprint to put to end this problem. Okay, now before the next person, let me make it very clear. I will get those mics switched off if people don't ask their questions and sit down. Because you have to be considerate. Look at the queue of people who want to speak. So please, can we be very, very Considerate. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Jake Epele. I'm the CEO and founder of the Albino Foundation. My question to you, sir, borders on health, access to health. I've been diagnosed with skin cancer. I have no hope to get immediate cure. What would you do, not only for me as a person that have been given the opportunity to ask you this question, but for millions? of persons with albinism, what would you do okay. to make sure we have access to quality health care? Thank you. Okay, let, let's come back and take those questions before we go back. There, there are three. The first uh, was basically a quote from your former boss, President uh, Obasanjo, describing you. And the question was whether if you were an employer and somebody sent that reference for someone that you wanted to employ, whether you would give him a job, implying that Given what Obasanjo said about you, why should Nigerians employ you? The second question was to do with how you would deal with the herder farmer problem, and the third one was on health. Thank you very much. Well, if the referee has changed his mind and says that the applicant is now the best applicant, and I recommend him for the job. <laughs> So was, um, let's, let's, then, then let's, let's interrogate that a little before we pass through. Let's interrogate that a little. If, if someone, you've done something to someone that, and they've forgiven you, for example, it doesn't mean the crime didn't take place. It doesn't mean that what was said to have happened didn't happen. It just means the person has decided to move on or that you are the lesser of two evils if they are comparing you to another person. Some of his allegations were quite specific. You need to... The, you know, yeah. Kaduria, you must know that nobody has been investigated by Obasanjo more than myself. If Obasanjo <laughs> could not find me guilty of any wrongdoing, then I don't think those you know, statements stand. Did he lie about you? I'm not here to say that. I'm not here to say that. But it's, 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 it's curious. Up to, it's, it's up to my employers. 
It's up to my employers to say or not. But if I was the most investigated politician or public officer and I was not found wanting, then it's up to it's up to it's up to my employers to believe what the hell what has been said or not. Okay. Next question. Yes, did you want just to just to make comments on this? Mm. You've seen in football today where referees have taken time to look at videos seriously and decide that the action they took yesterday was wrong based on replay. The, the referee has changed his mind, but he has seen the replay. That's what he has done. to take a quick break. Please don't go away. to the candidates of the People's Democratic Party. Um, before the break, there were a few questions you were trying to answer. Yeah. Um, there's one on health, and then one on the farmer herder clashes. So maybe we can start from there. Um, thank you very much. Um, 
for asking the issue of farmer husband uh, clash. I believe that the best solution to the farmer husband uh, clash is to try and enlighten our herdsmen on the use of feeding lots. And these feeding lots can conveniently be established all over the country. Because we have a number of you know, uh, factories that are producing animal feeds, livestock feeds. There is need for an extensive public enlightenment to these herders to adopt this solution. It's a way, you know, to minimizing as much as possible the herdsmen farmers clash. It is an old conflict dating back to the years of the prophets. America has faced the same thing. Eventually, the solution they found was the establishment of feeding lots all over the country. So there, even the herders will find that the cattle have more milk and more beef. And okay. therefore, they can earn, in fact, better income or more income if they adopt that system. So explain the system a little bit more. Is it something that you put on the normal grazing routes? How does it work? Because these are people who are nomadic, yes. who are used to moving. So yes. maybe you can explain a little bit more. You know, how I explain is that each, you know, let's say state government, through extension services, you know, can enlighten the herders. It used to happen before only that it's been abandoned. And if you enlighten the herders, and then you teach them how they can remain in one place with the feedlots, it costs a little bit of money. But the money, they are, the income they are going to generate from the milk and the beef will far, you know, exceed, you know, their, their, their expenses in buying the, 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 the feeds, the so livestock So it's feeds. going to be a change of life for com them. Com they become com sedentary yes, instead of moving. Yes, completely. It has, it has to be over a period of time. But you it, realize that there are those who will not like that. That actually no, it is their I, way I, of life. I, I believe majority of them, when we introduce nomadic education, at least we were able to get them to settle in one place. Not until the nomadic education uh, process or system was abandoned. And then they started roaming about. Now, some states... Um, I have a guy who is today, uh, I mean, a PhD holder. He started from nomadic school. Okay, so in, there are states, for example, that have indicated they really do not want the presence of um, herders within their land. And I, they've put, brought in laws, like the anti-grazing law in Benue. What is your position we have on to that look sort at, of We law? have to look at the constitutionality of those laws. I'm not sure whether they come with the provisions of our constitution, which guarantees, you know, free movement and, you, you know, the right to reside wherever you decide to live in a country and so on and so forth. So we have to look at this. Okay. Yes. Now, talking about free movement, um, Mr. Obi, as governor, you deported beggars from Anambra State. Deported? That's, yes. <laughs> you deported beggars. No. To acquire back to their state of ne origin. Never. Somebody and deported from Lagos. No, no, no. And you, I challenge it. No, you deported never. from Anambra. Let me tell you. So what happened? I, I, was the, I was the person who complained about somebody deporting beggars from their state. You never took beggars to never. acquire Ibo. In fact, they are welcomed because they are citizens of the place. You know my wife is so Akwaibo. How can I deport people to their state? <laughs> That's because I suffer. <laughs> Every Akwaibo, people from Akwaibo, people from Akwaibo are okay, so welcome to my state. So the, the, the information out there that you deported beggars was wrong? I said... No, I want, Canaria, I, I want a straight answer. Canaria, I'm marrying one of the best women anybody can no, marry. No, no. I can't deport these uh, people. Rather, I brought them okay. to Anambra. So, so did you ever deport any beggars to any other state never. outside of Anambra? I have never in my life discriminated against any human being, and I will never. If they actually have issues or disability, I love them. Because they're supposed to be cared 
by the society is to show them love, not hatred. Right. Now let me, because we've talked on the issue of insecurity, I think maybe this is an opportunity for us to talk a little bit more about it before we go to the question on health. Since you've dealt with the harder farmer clashes, um, you, you talked earlier about the fact that uh, this government came to power on three promises, including security. And you inferred in that answer um, issues you had with the way Boko Haram is being dealt with, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd like to have a conversation regarding the Nigerian army, for example, and the role that they are playing in fighting Boko Haram. Um, what are your views regarding what is going on in the Northeast, but also in places like Kaduna, where we've seen clashes between the army and Shiites? And that, you know, that uh, whole thing about uh, the army confronting them on the streets, including even here in Abuja. Well, let me say on the issue of Boko Haram. I think I can only assume the complaints by the fighting military, you know, is the reason why we have witnessed setbacks. And that is lack of equipment, lack of welfare to the fighting troops, and so on and so forth. If that is the case, then we have to review and make sure that adequate equipment in terms of confronting you know, terrorists are really made available you know, to these ordinary soldiers who sacrifice their lives to keep us safe. The allegation is that the hierarchy of the military is involved in corruption. We've read you know, various allegations. They haven't been proven. Would you be willing to investigate the hierarchy of the more military? Than willing, more than willing. Okay. More than willing. More than willing. Believe me, if you are a commander and I have given you all what you require in terms of equipment, in terms of welfare of your troops, and then you are overrun, I will deal with you. I will ask you, you have failed, go. If you don't go, then there are consequences. We cannot continue to accept that kind of situation whereby, you know, commanders lose lives, lose equipment, you know, uh, to, to, to terrorists, and then nothing happens to them. What about the Shiite issue? The Shiite issue, I do not see any role for the military there. If the Shiites have misbehaved, let the police step in. I just can't even understand how the military got involved there. They said because the Shiites blocked them. If the Shiites blocked them, all what you need to do is invite the police. Okay, so because it's... it's it's, it's policing aspect. It's, it's not a military aspect. So groups like Amnesty International have repeatedly called for members of the military that were involved both in the killings in Zaria as well as the more recent killings in Abuja to be arrested and prosecuted for murder and for, in some cases, they say genocide. Is this something you are willing to consider? If you I don't know what evidence the Amnesty International has. So I cannot work on that. But you'll be willing to investigate? I will be willing to investigate. Okay. For sure. Right. So specifically with the Northeast problem, you've talked about uh, equipment and more... You know, welfare, for, for welfare and training. Other, what else? Training, mm. you know. I mean, these are things that motivate troops. You know, good training, good equipment good welfare. Is the solution in your head a wholly militaristic solution or not? Of course, it has to be, you know, a, a mixed grill of giving the right kind of political leadership and also the right kind of military leadership, you know, to confront the situation. Okay, sir. The question on health so that we can go back to the audience. The question of health, we have not been investing in health, just like I said, we have not been investing enough in education. That's why we find ourselves where we have found ourselves today. 
it requires more investment in health. And if you go into our you know, uh, policy document, you will find that we are committed to investing more in healthcare. And again, this is an area where I am also involved. Because currently I have you know, an agreement with the Saudi German hospital to set up a hospital here in Abuja. In fact, we have started, uh, we have set up you know, the, the consultancy, the clinical uh, aspect of it in the next one year or two, we'll set up a 100 beds uh, hospital. So you need again here to bring in private sector investment. Besides, you know, uh, committing more funds you know, to public health. In, in, in countries where we've seen private health privatized, um, the poorest of the poor don't seem to be able to do well because um, health care is very expensive. I, I, don't what believe do you it, I don't believe it should be privatized. I mean, it should be a, you know, a private sector and public sector. Uh, it should be a mixed grid because our people may not be able, will not, definitely will not be able to okay. do afford. So governments should spend more money on health care. No okay. doubt about because it. it sounds like you are thinking through it now as you are sitting here. No, not thinking through it. Okay. Read, read, read uh, our policy document. You find that both, you know, both uh, approaches are advocated there. Okay, so, so who will get the private sector care? Who will get the one from the public the sector? I'm trying sector, to understand those, the details. The private sector, those who can afford, either through you know, their own uh, resources or through uh, insurance. So, so how will government decide who to give health care to and who not to give health care to? Of government should be able to know who are the, at the lowest you know, income ladder. We know. We know our poor people. We know those who can afford. We know those who cannot afford. I'm trying to understand you, you how see, you, you run see, the scheme. You, you know, there are like, like practical ways of rolling you, out programs yes. like that. Okay, you see, there is something that I have also instituted locally in my place, what I call the Popas Fund. In other words, from time to time, I deposit a certain amount of money at the Federal Medical Center in Yola, and I appoint a committee of very credible people. I say, manage this. Anybody who has come to this hospital and cannot afford to pay his bill, you take from that Popas Fund and treat that nobody Nobody should come to that hospital without being treated. And it is working very, very efficiently. It's been on now for about four or five years. Let's talk and about it's not much money. Mm. Let's talk about tax. Recently, um, it was reported that you paid an amount that people thought was very small for tax, given how wealthy you are. And we have established that sitting here. We've heard about your farms. We've heard about your logistics company, we've heard about recent, your hospital now, and all those other things. I can things. tell you more. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so, so how come your tax payment is so low, and in your manifesto you're planning to cut corporate tax and okay. make it even okay. lower okay. for let rich me, people like yourself? Let me, okay, let me tell you. Uh, all my companies are paying tax. You can go and verify that one. The but tax, you are the tax, personally the tax, wealthy. The tax I am paying is what I earn from public purse. What I earn as corporate is being paid by the corporate entities. Ah, okay. So yes. you've paid more taxes than what was publicized. Of course, for sure, for Can sure. Can you tell us how much? Honestly, I wouldn't know. I you don't, don't know. I don't, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Okay. It's a lot of money. Okay. Now, part of From the your last, the last figure I've seen is a lot of money. Okay. The manifesto that I saw also talked about cutting corporate tax. Yes. Please explain the rationale for that. The rationale behind that is that when you reduce corporate tax, you give incentive to investors to come in and invest. And when they invest, they create jobs. And when those jobs are created, the people who get employed also pay taxes. So in, in all cases where you effect or implement you know, corporate, lower corporate taxation, you have seen the GDP 
going up and up and up and up. And, and yet, when I spoke to a few CEOs before coming to do this program, I, I, I'm not a business person, but I spoke to a few people, and what they said is that um, lower corporate tax in itself is not enough, that actually businesses are more concerned about policy, yes. infrastructure, it, yeah. and the right environment, and that they might actually even be willing to pay higher taxes in return for these other conditions, and so that that in itself isn't enough. They are right. You also have to look at this the holistically. In other words, the policy. You will find where we also talk of infrastructure, where we talk about power, where we talk about skills. All these things tend to definitely direct investors. Ease of doing business and so on and so forth. Tend to really direct investors where to invest. And by the time you take a holistic view of all these issues, for sure, you will see investments uh, coming in. It's time for another That's quick it. break. Stay with us. Welcome back. You are watching The Candidates, a presidential town hall series brought to you by Daria Media and the Nigerian Television Authority with the support of the MacArthur Foundation. We are in conversation with the presidential and vice presidential candidates of the PDP. A quick reminder for those watching at home, you can still take part by sending your questions 
using the social media handles scrolling across the screen. Um, let let's just, dive straight actually into those questions from people at home because we have very little time. Let me just make a little screen. comment on this Maybe issue of Maybe you can tax. answer it along okay. with all these other questions because look at all the papers I have, yeah? Um, so this is from Abdurrahman Leme, um, who says, what moral high ground do you have to ask Nigerians for their trust in you to fight corruption when you are one of the biggest beneficiaries of corruption? Um, the other one says, the federal government on allegedly, the federal government under which you served allegedly spent 16 billion generating power without substantial improvement. How can you promise us that you are going to improve power? Um, then I want to know your thoughts on the uh, CJ saga, the circumvention of the law allegedly by Mr. President, and the clear evidence um, against Ona, on, Onogen. What is the ideal outcome in your view to this situation? Um, and then finally, maybe we'll take one more. Um, Dear Alhaji Atiku, is, granting, is the granting of a private university license to yourself while in government a conflict of interest? And isn't it criminal that you left public universities in a rut just to build one of the best private universities in Nigeria? So these are questions from the audience um, that we have, and maybe we could take that. Can I come in? Yes. Let, let, me, let, me, let me again tell you. Let me answer from the last one. He built a private university. Tell me who else among this class that built one. <laughs> and to show you that he wasn't building the university for money, he built it in Adamawa. He had the opportunity as vice president to take land in Abuja and build it, or built it in Lagos. He saw the imperative of education for development and went to develop an area that should have been developed. I want us to Part be of, Can I ask a quick question on yes. education, please? Yeah? Yes, go on, go on. Let me ask a quick question on education. Um, when you are in a country in like Nigeria where public education um, has become really poor, and I think virtually all of us here are beneficiaries of public school. The general um, hope is that people in public office would actually focus on fixing public schools, the same public schools that they benefited from, as opposed to setting up private institutions that are only affordable to a few. Isn't that really an important issue to look at? Let me help you. On the PDP, they started you universal basic education, mm. even went to tax companies to put them 2%, establish that office to be able to educate the people. And it was actually partnering with states in order to educate their people. Go and look at all the states that are doing badly today. They are from one party. So if you look at what PDP has done, because you look at the 16 years of PDP, like you've just said, they spent 16 billion and there's no power. One, that is lie. But let me even tell you. This is according to a 2008 National Assembly report. Let me even tell you. It's not from okay. any number okay. that we Thank you very much. Let me even tell you. 16 billion dollars. Dollars. Yes. As of the time PDP was in government, at an approximate rate of 150 is 2.4 trillion. This particular government, this particular government have in the past, in 2016 and 2017, borrowed a total of 7 trillion, 428 million, and said it's for capital Vote. So, so, so they've no. done as bad. No, no, no. Wait, 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 wait. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. They've done as bad as. No, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. I just want to finish. Let me just finish. They have borrowed seven trillion four hundred twenty-eight billion, 
I said it's for capital vote. The capital expenditure, the capital expenditure in 2016 is 1.2 trillion. The capital expenditure in 2017, by demo, is 1.5. So assuming that was actually expended, there's almost 5 trillion unaccounted for. To even further, to even further expansion on that issue. But we're now talking no, about, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. We are now talking about what PDP did and now what APC did. So essentially you're saying you did badly, they did worse, so Nigerians should be looking for a third Thank option. Thank you. No, 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 let me, come on, let me come into that. Even part of those who were part of what you said that was bad, I said they've moved on to the side. So those who are remaining here are those who are committed to doing it better. Let me tell you what your power, power. APC has never invest, invested one cobo in power in the past four years. All they are talking now about, all you see anything about power today were those investments that PDP did. And even to implement it, they didn't pull in it. Okay. So what they've done is that is PDP continuation can show you, a problem in no, government? PDP can even show you no, I'm asking, where they spend those systems. Is, is it your view that continuation in government is a problem? Meaning, if you come into government today, will you truncate everything that has been started by a previous administration? Let me tell you. Let me give you an example. You saw APC commissioning airports. They did not put one naira in those airports. It was, it was, it was loan obtained by PDP, counterpart funding fully paid. They only came and delayed the project. And then now that the election is coming, they're commissioning. Okay. You saw them we've talking got, about train. We've got 10 minutes, and okay. we have a few questions, no. yeah? Okay. So try and... Let me, I was going to go to issue of because tax. Because I want to go back to Alaji Atiku. I want to go back to issue of tax, because you talked about tax. Okay. I'm taking his authority to say what I'm saying here, because he is in charge. And I'm taking his authority to do that. And I'm saying, if you're talking about the issue of tax and law and tax, look at all the places where there have been fast development. Let's take the issue of Dubai. It was a desert when they told everybody, no tax, nothing. The world came there. So when you lower tax, the world will come in. And if you're talking about private sector driven economy, you need the private sectors to come and invest. So what Let me tell you, you what the private sector your programs if you you lower tax, you are a mono economy, and yet you keep talking about these ambitious programs that you are going to run. Where is the money going to come from? Let me tell you where the money will come from. This is what I'm saying. Let me tell you where the money is going to come from. And I've used two economies in Africa to tell you. The budget of South Africa is $120 billion, 55 million people. The budget of Nigeria is 30 billion, 198 million people. What it didn't show is the missing link. The missing link is that South Africa have put their economy, knowing the deficit and everything, that everything has to be driven by private sector. So it's, and it reduces corruption. So instead of going to build airports, build ports where you have to put in your relations and everything to run them, you put it in a private sector hand where they can go to the capital market, borrow money, do it more efficiently. It helps your capital market to okay. grow. It helps the system. By that, you create more jobs, like what you were talking about. Okay. Quick questions, because I'm told, you know, they're in my ear telling me we're about to wrap up. And so I have to ask two very quick questions. Because you've raised the issue of privatization, you were the head of the Economic Council during your time as vice president. Some of the privatization that took place under your watch left a lot to be desired. And I'll give you two quick examples. Alscon in Ikot Abasi, a facility that was built uh, for close to $3.5 billion, sold for 250 million naira, oh, sorry, $250 million way below market price. Then we have issues of where, when NITA was privatized, it's only this year we started paying pensioners. So 
People are saying, actually, privatization under you was a bit of a mixed bag. It's not this big success that is being touted. What are, what's your response to that? Well, in, in any policy that you implement, you know, you are bound to find, you know, some, uh, some, some mistakes here and there. But in the overall... So you, you admit look at, to mistakes? If, if overall, if you, look at, if you look at the reform, uh, you know, of our government and also the privatization, you find that it's a huge success. It's what, a huge success. What did you do then that you will not do on your second coming? Do you have any regrets? Are there any things that you, when you look back and you think, well, I've learned from that, and if I come back as president, I will avoid this? Yeah, I, I'll give you an example. You are talking about education. You know, when we were in office, we sent a bill to the National Assembly to make education compulsory for every Nigerian child from primary to secondary education. But you know, education is virtually a state and local government affair. And as a result of that legislation, we established the UBE and also imposed taxes. And all this revenue is remitted to states and local governments mm. to help educate these poor Nigerians who cannot get uh, education. Eventually, most of this money was mismanaged at the state level and local government levels. And going through the legislation, I discovered that we made a mistake. And what mistake did we make? We did not have a provision to penalize any level of government, whether it is state or local government, if they fail to implement those policies. And I think if I have another opportunity, I will return the law to the National Assembly. I say, look, insert a penalty clause where a state is giving money or local government is giving money to invest in education or public education and it decides not to do, we will have the right okay. to penalize or take their money from even the profession. <laughs> and, 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 go, and go directly and intervene in the education of those kids. Let me tell you what I did. Let me just give me time. Two Don't cut me off. No, 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 no. Let it's me tell not me. He said yes. No, 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 no. When I was vice president, mm. I took a tour to Anambara State during the administration of Governor Mbadi Niju. I found that the public schools were closed for two years. I came back and met the president. I said, Mr. President, this governor will never be allowed to go back. He said, why? I said, I found all the public schools in Anambara State overtaken by which For two years, they were not open. Believe me, I made sure Badiniju never went back. Okay. This is, let me tell you, this is how I feel about education. You see? And, and but for that education, I will not be what I am today. I, okay. I come from we very, very poor, very, we very poor. Yes. A final question for the two of you before we have to go. If you lose elections, will you accept the results? If the elections are judged to be free, fair, and credible. Why not? I have lost elections before and I had admitted. Thank you very much, Mr. Peter Obi, Alhaji Abubakar. Sadly, we've run out of time and have to leave it here. I want to thank Alhaji Achiko Abubakar again and Mr. Peter Obi, the candidates of the PDP. On behalf of the Nigeria Television Authority, Radio Nigeria, Daria Media, and the MacArthur Foundation, as well as PLAC, CDD, Sheraton Hotel, and all the media houses who aired the candidates. I am wishing Nigeria a peaceful and successful general elections. Please, please go out and vote. Have a good evening.